we depart from the entrance of Talbot Bay at the start of the flood tide to ride the tide across Collier Bay to Raft Point. Collier Bay is subject to some of the strongest tides in the Kimberley. Timing of the tides and maintaining 6.5 knots speed over ground was critical to cover the 37 nautical miles across Collier Bay before the tide turned on us. Failure to make the tide could see us being swept by the tide away from Raft Point. In the end, the careful timing saw us reach Raft Point 30 minutes before the change of tide, with a westerly sea breeze coming in behind us. We tuck in behind Raft Point for the night. The point gives moderate shelter from a westerly breeze with a bit of roll from the reflected swells. This is Raft Point, that's our dinghy down there, way down the beach drying out. We'll have to wait a little bit for the tide to come back. You can see the massive ties running out of Doubtful Bay here. I'm going to wait for those ties and then ride them into Red Cane Creek in a little while. There's Steep Island over there. There's the escarpment behind which the uh, one of these is an Aboriginal art site. And that's where we stayed last night in the anchorage behind the point here. A uh, bit rolly, um, especially on an incoming tide, but okay. These are just some of the last of the currents on the ebb tide coming out of Doubtful Bay. And they get to the tip of Raft Point up here. And they meet the currents coming out of uh, the end of Collier Bay and make a bit of a swirling mess just out here. The next day on a flooding tide we headed into Doubtful Bay towards Red Cone Creek to spend some time at Ruby Falls. We passed the landmark that marks the entrance of Red Cone Creek. The tidal limit off the creek is quite some distance from Ruby Falls. We are greeted by a number of micro cruise boats when we arrive. It takes around a 20 minute dinghy ride from the main anchorage to reach Ruby Falls. While enjoying the falls we meet Ruby from Great Escapes. Her dad and skipper of Great Escapes named the falls after her when he first visited the area back in the 1980s. The area includes an extensive waterway with many billabongs, swimming holes and smaller falls that extend quite some way inland.
Pretty snowflake water lilies, or nymphorties as they are known, are found along many of the swimming spots. Ruby from Great Escapes dropped by later to let us know of another lesser known spot, Little Ruby or Sapphire Falls. It's amazing how kind some of the smaller cruise people were to us on our trip. With Ruby's directions in hand, we set out to find Little Ruby Falls. With a bit of climbing and walking along a really pretty waterway, we arrive at a beautiful swimming rock hole where we meet the crew and guests of the Charter Boat Achievement. We help ferry them back to their tenders. They then invite us back to their boat for drinks and a sumptuous dinner of barramundi and mud crab. With the forecast changing to 30 knots southeasterly winds in a couple of days, we head back to Raft Point with the hope of continuing up the coast to Sampson Inlet the next day. After our really rolly night at Raft Point last time, we decided to set a stern anchor to reduce the rolling. It worked well until the tide changed and then had to be retrieved. We set off in the dark the next morning with heightened levels of stress and anxiety. It is always difficult to relax when navigating poorly charted and tide ripped waters in the dark. The run up the coast to Samson Inlet needed an average speed over ground of 5.5 knots to beat the tide. Motor sailing was needed to make the distance. We reached the narrow entrance of Samson Inlet with a building wind from astern. Samson Inlet is a very secure anchorage with protection from all quarters. We look forward to sheltering from the strong southeasterly winds and to explore the inlet. We pick up one of the cyclone moorings that dot the inlet.
With neat tides, reaching the end of the inlet is a challenge, with many shallow boulders to negotiate. The end of the inlet ends in a stony riverbed. We find a convenient rock hole that allows for the filling of our water containers. Featherheads, or tilotus as they are known, make a spectacular display. The creek further up makes for a gorgeous walk with small rock holes, paper barks and air filled with birdsong. To our surprise, one of the shallower pools was actually a hot spring with warm water bubbling up through the pebbles. Time to move on to Camden Harbour and the site of the only non-Indigenous attempt to settle in the West Kimberley. The entrance of Brecknock Harbour on the way to Camden Harbour is marked by the aptly named Finger Rock. We pass Koori Bay, the main land base for the multi-million dollar Paspali Pearls. With our relatively slow boat speed, we hooked many sharks when trawling for mackerel on our trip. Sheep Island and Camden Harbour finally come in sight. It's absolutely amazing some of the places these boabs grow. Almost in solid hump heap of rocks here. And this is Sheep Island in Camden Harbour in on this stiff sea breeze and expecting some really strong southeasterlies for the next couple of days at least and the little anchorage is quite crowded I think we've got about seven yachts in there now. Who says the Kimberleys are deserted? Camden Harbour is a sad story of an ill-fated attempt to settle in the West Kimberley. Settlers from Victoria were sold the dream of owning a piece of utopia in Australia's last frontier. Sadly, what greeted them in 1864 was a barren rocky landscape with limited water and poor and sometimes toxic feed for their livestock. One can only imagine the hardships they suffered arriving at the start of the wet season with its stifling heat and humidity. Many died in the ensuing months of torment along with most of their livestock. Despite investing their life savings, the lucky ones left in the first few months, losing everything they owned but saving themselves. Within a year the settlement was abandoned, leaving behind ruins of crumbling rocks barely recognisable as the meagre dwellings that they once were.
Some of those that died and were left behind now rest on the lonely sheep island that overlooks Camden Harbour. Most of the graves, like the ruins ashore, are now barely recognisable piles of stone. Only one lonely headstone remains, that of Mary Jane Pascoe, who died in childbirth at the age of 30 from acute fever. Her grave stands a lonely vigil over Camden Harbour, a stark reminder of the hardships that the people faced in the hope of a better life. And as the sun sets, we take time to be thankful for our lives and to ponder on what lies ahead for us on our own journey through the Kimberley.